about Hey Host. Um, the neat thing about Hey Host's book is that she she is a very well respected climate scientist. She was recently appointed as the chief of the Nature Conservancy, chief scientist of the Nature Conservancy, and she's contributed to some of the most uh, important global. Uh, pieces of research and analysis on what is causing climate change and what the predicted outcomes are. Uh, but the thing that's neat about her book is that it's it's not a book about how the world is burning down. She does a really good job of explaining climate change and why it's happening. But the nice part of the book is that she's really focusing on um, what we can do as a community members to change this. And a lot of what she talks about isn't, um, she, she talks a lot about the fact that information's important, facts are important, but what she shows you in the book is that when you deluge people with information, even if researched, often they can, it can cause them to push back really hard. So the gist of her book is that through case studies, et cetera, she's trying to encourage people to do uh, collective action by identifying um, with the people in their community that share their same values and share their same sort of uh, identity as a community. So for us here on Lummi, of course, we're all islanders. Um, there's other islands in the Puget Sound, or excuse me, the Salish Sea that we could identify with. And we're a rural community. So right there, we have an identity that we share and probably priorities that are a little different than, say, the folks on the mainland. So, And she encourages you to be aligned with those folks and find them. So one of the reasons today that although we have this lovely virtual opportunity, um, I also thought it was really important we got together face to face, even though our presenters needed to present mobily or virtually, is that it's really an opportunity to start recognizing who in your community shares these values. So that as we go forward, there might be more of us who want to do collective action. So I'm not volunteering anybody, but just saying you might want to join in. <laughs> um, so you'll see that both Charles and David are remote tonight. Uh, with that, I did mention the Q&A will be at the end, you know, hold your questions, we'll do that. Um, and with that, I do just want to introduce our two speakers. Uh, like I said, both are islanders and residents, and we're lucky to have them here. So they not only understand what's going on in the committee, but they really relate to what it's like to live on the island. So I think that that's a really special perspective for our presenters. Um, first of all, we have Dave Kirshner, who helped uh, draft the Whatcom County's 2021 Climate Action Plan, which will also be a link to that in the follow-up email that I send, and um, served for five years as a member of the county's Climate Impact Advisory Committee. He just cycled off. Um, he's worked as a researcher for the Institute for Energy and Environmental Research in Maryland and a research fellow with Sightline Institute in Seattle. He studied natural resource policy at the University of Michigan in, 19, in the 1990s, and most importantly, most importantly, he attended Beach Elementary for part of the fifth grade. He is an alum of our esteemed educational institution here on the island. So he really shares the identity of the long-term islanders. Uh, second, we have Charles Bailey, who uh, served on YFAC until January 2022 for six years and is now in his second year on the Climate Impact Advisory Committee. From 1972 to 1976, and again from 1982 to 2001, Charles worked as a grant maker with the Ford Foundation overseas in India, Egypt, Sudan, Bangladesh, Kenya, and Vietnam. Um, Charles is the author, along with Dr. Lee K. Sol. Sorry if I slaughtered that. But Charles, I did my best, um, of uh, From Enemies to Partners, Vietnam, the U.S., and Agent Orange. So with that, and a round of applause for them coming and seeing us, I want to turn the floor over to David, and he's going to kick off our presentation. Thank you, Wendy. Thank, thank you, uh, Resilient Lummy, for inviting Charles and me to be here. I'm honored to be um, working with, with Charles, my friend and, and colleague from the Climate Committee. Um, I This is actually probably the first Zoom presentation I've done, so um, it's... Uh, it kind of feels like being on TV, which I've never been on TV. Charles has, um, so just bear with me. Um, if um, we can bring up that that first slide, Wendy, um, just wanted to start with some levity. If given this somber topic, do we have that on the screen? I'm just seeing us. 
us folks. Yeah. Just a second, David, we're getting it up. Okay. Now you should have it. No. And if, if we just scroll, uh, click down a couple of slides, we'll get to a cartoon. There you go. By Tom Tolles, who was a political cartoonist for about 50 years and did many cartoons about climate change. Well, so to focus our minds, sometimes it's helpful to imagine ourselves in the future. Unfortunately, we don't have a time machine to take us back to 1988 when climate scientist James Hansen, whom you may remember, uh, pre presented to a Senate committee and uh, warned the world that climate change was a serious threat and was quote unquote, all happening now. Well, that was 35 years ago. Fortunately, there's a growing recognition that climate change is a serious threat and that if we don't make it priority one, our goose is going to be cooked, so to speak. Uh, in 2021, as many of you may know, our state representatives and our governor um, put a price on carbon in the form of the Climate Commitment Act. And what that means is that we end up paying closer to the real cost of putting more carbon pollution into our atmosphere when we burn fossil fuels like propane and gasoline. In economists speak, and my colleague Charles is um, an economist by background, uh, I believe has a doctoral degree in, in economics. It means that we are starting to quote, uh, price in all the health, property, and environmental damage that is being done by carbon and methane pollution. But it's going to take more than a price on carbon to keep wow. things from getting much worse, unfortunately. We need more people rating climate change as, as a number 10 on the list of issues that uh, are important to them, and far more people taking collective action to stabilize, stabilize our climate. And it is encouraging that this group has formed because that is uh, a sign of collective action. And that is why I applied to serve on the county's Climate Impact Advisory Committee and why I am grateful that Resilient Lummi is hosting this presentation. And on that note, I am going to turn it over to my colleague, Charles. Charles. Well, thank you, David. And uh, next slide, please. Thank you, Wendy. And thank you all of all the members of Resilient Lummi for this opportunity. It's really great to work with you, Dave, on yet another project. Uh, we're here today because the science is clear about the immense challenge that we all face and the need for all of us to take the bull by the horns and act on climate change. The more carbon we pump into our atmosphere, the greater the risk of very serious and quite possibly irreversible consequences. Consequences that will become increasingly impossible to prepare for and adapt to. So we all are, I think, in this discussion, nines and tens on Dave's scale of uh, increasing concern about climate. Others are not yet at that end of the scale, as Catherine Hayhoe points out in her book. It's not because they somehow don't get it, she says. It's because their fear of solutions outweighs their fear of the impacts. Greta Thunberg, in speaking to the French National Assembly a few years ago, said, political leaders are starting to declare climate emergencies and announcing, announcing dates for so-called climate neutrality. Any declare and declaring a climate emergency is good, but only setting up vague distant dates and saying things that give the impression that things are not be, that are being done and, and action is underway will most likely do more harm than good because the changes that are required are still nowhere in sight. So it's, it's a challenge, but it's a challenge in moving to a better place. 
So today we're going to talk about the Whatcom County Climate Impact Advisory Committee. And then based on various discussions, we've come up with some suggestions for discussions on what all of us and each of us here on Lummi Island can, can do in this regard. Dave? So why did the county create a Climate Impact Advisory Committee? Well, back in 2017, uh, the county was already experiencing the impacts of, of climate change, declining salmon runs, increasing summer heat, more intense wildfires, and the county's climate, imp the county did have a climate action plan, but it was uh, published in 2007, and it was out of date. It didn't even talk about adapting to the changing climate. So, uh, lacking staff resources to update the plan, uh, the county council decided to enlist community volunteers to um, update the plan, but also to um, review uh, and make recommendations to the county council, quote, on issues related to the preparation and adaptation for and the prevention and mitigation of impacts of climate change. And uh, in 2019, uh, so the, the committee came together in 2018. I was uh, on the original uh, group. And in 2019, after we got our bearings and um, had some uh, preliminary background discussions, we solicited input from over a hundred uh, different uh, individuals in the county, uh, tri members of tribes, of business groups, of nonprofits, and uh, drafted a, um, a report called the Community Research Project, which you can find on the committee's website. Then in 2022, or sorry, in uh, 2020, uh, the committee formed working groups to develop strategies and actions and um, worked with the consulting firm to conduct uh, what they call a climate vulnerability assessment to see what, what the greatest risks were uh, in the county. And then in uh, 2021, we began writing the report and uh, worked with uh, technical advisors got feedback from them and then had a uh, 30 day uh, public review period and all uh, the results of that were logged and that's available on the website and the council actually um, adopted the plan on November 9th 2021 so um, the the next slide will show um, the structure and, and focus of the plan. The, the Climate Action Plan is divided into two main categories, the built environment and the natural environment, and actions in the plan to combat climate change either fall into the category of mitigation, meaning the reduction or avoidance of emissions of heat trapping gases, or adaptation, meaning steps to avoid or minimize climate impacts that are going to occur even with reduced emissions. And uh, the, uh, on the built environment side, electri electrification of uh, transportation and space heating of buildings is really uh, the key. And uh, that, that is the focus if you read the plan. On the natural environment side, the focus is on water resources. Here in Whatcom County, uh, we're seeing hotter summers and more drought. And the, the way that we can adapt to climate change and um, deal with, with um, uh, water scarcity is, is to protect and enhance the function of, of our, our waterways, such as stream restoration. So uh, land use that you see in the middle is, 
is really key. And that's probably the most important tool that the county has to mitigate or reduce emissions and, and adapt to, to climate change. So we, we need to start thinking about this all as, as one system. Um, the combined uh, electricity and buildings chapter uh, really focuses on what we call grid assets, and that is uh, buildings use of electricity, but also how we produce electricity on the grid. And I'm going to turn it over to Charles to talk more about the specifics of the plan. Well, thank you. As you can see here are the elements of the plan, but I be should begin by picking up on what Dave said about land use and the tools that the county actually has available to it. As you know, our county government is the government of the unincorporated portions of Whatcom County. There are seven cities of which only the city of Bellingham, to my knowledge, currently has a climate action plan. So in a way, this is to try to change the tenor of the discussion in the county and to encourage uh, other jurisdictions to follow along. So I joined a year ago, well, a little more than a year ago in February uh, 2022, uh, just after the plan had been adopted by, adopted by the county council. And while we were, uh, the county was setting about hiring a climate action manager. So one of my first tasks was to work with them on the drafting of the uh, scope of work and the terms of reference and the actual recruitment documents for this per the person. And I'm pleased to say that although it's been a year, uh, Lauren Clements has joined as the Whatcom County Council Climate Action Manager. And uh, she's placed in the Public Works Department. Uh, she joined about three weeks ago. She formerly held uh, this a similar position for the city of Bloomington, Indiana, which is uh, much seems to be much further along than Whatcom County on these matters. So, in the interim, the members, the eleven members of the, of the committee, set about trying to get the ball rolling in several of these areas. And uh, I'll just go through them quickly in terms of mitigation promoting renewable energy, emphasizing community solar. Uh, several of us drafted a, um, a, a memo to the county executive on positions he should advocate before the state legislature to promote uh, community solar, arcane things like uh, raising the cap on, on permissible solar rooftop expansion, um, legalizing so-called virtual net metering, which would allow um, community solar to uh, actually technically work as well as uh, people who are in uh, multi-unit uh, uh, apartment buildings to benefit from solar on the roof of their building. Um, we started a dialogue about with um, British uh, BP at Cherry Point and one of our members, or two of our members, one of them a process engineer at BP and the other an atmospheric scientist who come up with a plan which BP is considering to uh, put up a solar array of about just over one square mile at Cherry Point, which would produce enough local electricity uh, for BP's entire refinery operations. So, uh, but because of Cherry Point, uh, Whatcom County has three times the per capita greenhouse gas emissions of the state average. And so this is, uh, while not easy, but it seems to be clear the action that we can take with BP to uh, reduce their greenhouse gases in our vicinity. Fully electrifying existing buildings, uh, Dave mentioned. Um, the, um, here uh, we drafted a replacement for the old wind energy code which a, uh, in 2011, the Whatcom County Council passed the, one of the most restrictive codes, basically because they were offended by proposals to put a um, wind generator on the top of Galebraith Mountain, even though that had gone through all the 
necessary environmental clearances. Um, this is a code that would replace it and make it possible for many other parts of the county and uh, outside of forest land and industrial areas to potentially uh, put up wind generators. And this is, uh, was, uh, is now with the Planning Commission and then we'll go forward to County Council hopefully in, in a couple of months for, for approval. So these are examples of the kinds of nuts and bolts that should make um, a greater local production of electricity uh, more and more possible. Uh, charging stations, we made less progress on this, but the idea is to put charging stations on county owned land that is parking lots and expand the regional trail network for commuting. There is to my, I realized when I got on the committee, quite an extensive set of bikeable, walkable trails in the county. And so this is to link them together. So it's practically possible to go across the county on trail safely to get to school or to get to work. An adaptation, um, incorporating climate risks into the update of the comp plan. We all know about the Growth Management Act in Washington state, the 1993 legislation that basically aimed to curb urban sprawl. But in those days, it didn't have anything to say about climate change. Well, now our comp plan update will have lots to say about um, how to carry out, uh, the, how, to, how the county can use its land use planning and, uh, and building approval processes uh, to promote um, a reduction in greenhouse gases and adaptation to uh, adverse climate uh, effects. Protect riverbanks and wetlands to increase base flows. Um, under this, we discussed the department, the State Department of Natural Resources has a carbon program in which they will withdraw uh, timberland that they own from uh, timber auctions for logging uh, into, uh, and reserve it uh, to sequester carbon for 40 years. And there are several of these parcels that they are doing this to in uh, Whatcom County. This is a, as usual with all of these measures, there are trade-offs. In this case, it turns out in rural Whatcom County and other rural parts of the state, these timber resources, the DNR, are actually a very important part of funding the local school systems. So if you take timber out of, out of production, you have to think about substituting in those school budgets from other sources. Ensuring a stable land base for agriculture uh, so that farmers continue to farm, expand the conservation easement program, and creating an online dashboard that presents key climate change indicators. Dave, you had a, a leading role in, in, the, in the committee on developing this. Dave actually looked at these websites from Country, uh, cities and jurisdictions across the US and we've come up with a design that we think will be better. And uh, anyway, Lauren is now with us and uh, perhaps we can get her to come to a future meeting of Resilient uh, Lame because she knows far more about these things than, than I do. Um, but I think it's time to have a look at the committee itself. So Dave, will you take over? Thank you, Charles, for that excellent overview of near-term priorities of the Climate Action Plan. So here is a list of the current members of the plan, or of the committee, rather. And uh, there are 11 uh, voting members, plus a representative of the council. In this case, it's council member Kaylee Galloway, who actually used to be on the committee and then was elected to a council seat from South Bellingham. And she has been very active on climate issues and was made chair of the uh, Climate and Natural Resources Committee. Um, and you can see the diverse backgrounds of, of the people on the committee. Um, and it's really a great place to uh, learn about what the county is doing to address climate change. It's 
you could call it a clearinghouse. I think that's how Charles has described it. And uh, it's it's a place to hear from uh, the the council about what they're working on with respect to climate. Uh, council member Galloway does a report e pretty much each meeting. We've had members of representatives from Olympia, uh, members of the legislature come and talk about bills that relate to climate. So I encourage you to um, sign up for the agendas. You could email uh, Lauren Clemens. There's actually a typo there. I think uh, there's no T, it's just Clemens. And she is the contact person for the committee now that she's the climate action manager. And um, she could add you to the list of people who receive those agendas. And um, your, your feedback is, is really welcome. And uh, there's an informal comment period or you can just come and listen. So um, I am now gonna turn it back to Charles to help us zoom in on Lummi Island. I couldn't resist, Charles. Well, we thank you, Dave. Um, I, I found these uh, committee meetings fascinating. And, and uh, just to uh, underscore what you said, they're the best single place to learn in real time what's going on in climate change and also what's not going on in our county. But here we are, uh, 1,500 feet above our county, looking from Linden towards uh, out to sea. Only the sea has come inland, it seems. These, of course, were the terrible floods of November 2021. And if you uh, look at the top of the picture, the kind of trapezoid there is the Lummi Nation Highlands. And of course, this is the Nooksack River and the city of Ferndale in the upper center and way out in the distance is our island. And I think this is uh, important to reflect before we dive into things we can do on the island, is some of the larger challenges of climate change and its impact on transportation and livelihoods and food security uh, that impact our county and our island is a part of that county and the, um, the viability of our economy. And so keeping all of that in mind, now let's dive into our short list of things that um, might be considered. And we're, we'll talk about each of them in turn, but here's the list. Uh, moving away from ICE, uh, internal combustion engines, uh, vehicles for personal transportation, uh, there's been a lot of interest in building a community solar or wind microgrid for the island, so we'll talk about that. Uh, reduce solid waste. Uh, this was the subject of an excellent article recently in the Tome by uh, Wendy. Shift from propane as the main household energy source to propane as backup. And store carbon with forestry and agriculture. And finally, contact some officials because his as Greta Thunberg was indicating, um, you know, they need people like us and we need them real bad. Okay, over to you, Dave. Thank you, Charles. So in, in 2018, transportation represented the single largest source of US greenhouse gas emissions with electricity generation being a close second. So the best thing that we can all do is use our cars less, whether they're fossil fuel, they're internal combustion engine powered cars or electric cars. And human powered transportation is of course the lowest uh, carbon form of transportation. We have this family on their electric bike or at least um, three of them. And uh, public transit is of course, the second best option to human power. And then if you have to drive a car, well, um, then electric vehicles are a lower, lower carbon option when you look at the, the life cycle of the car, even, um, even though our electricity grid is, is not uh, as low carbon 
as it could be and still has about 60 percent i think it is that that comes from fossil fuels so now many of you may know this but some of you may not the inflation reduction act uh, that was passed last year by uh, congress actually includes a four thousand dollar income tax credit for used electric vehicles so for example my mother purchased a um, not too old <laughs> um, used 2015 vw e-golf in 2019 for $17,000. Well, with the tax credit, that would be down to only 13,000, which is um, a, a, a pretty good deal considering that um, we, we can make it to town and do all our errands and um, not, not run out of charge. It, it had, it'll go about uh, 85 to 90 miles on a charge and uh, we don't have to stop at the gas station. So in terms of electric vehicle charging, we installed a charger at home, but if say the ferry parking lot or the library had an electric vehicle charger, it would certainly make it easier for visitors to the island to travel here and not feel uh, that range anxiety or fear of running out of electrons. So on that note, we can talk more about electrons, Charles. More about electrons. Right. Building a microgrid for the island. Um, I have to tip my hat to Mike Skian, who formed a, brought a, created a conference online uh, this, uh, about three years ago on this subject. Before that, I knew nothing. Now I know uh, just a little bit less than nothing. I know a little bit about this, but the concept is fairly straightforward. As we move away from fossil towards electrifying everything, we have uh, the traditional top-down centralized generation uh, from, uh, from large uh, installations in, and long distances away often with transmission wires that bring it to local distribution and on to our homes to the end use to factories and uh, buildings of every kind. But the other idea is to build a system with greater resilience in energy, a new energy economy. And to, the, to do this is uh, to build in at the bottom here, bottom-up distributed energy resources or DERs is the jargon. Again, these are more bite-sized solar and wind installations often on rooftops and it's the idea is to produce more electricity locally uh, partly because we need more electricity overall uh, and particularly as we proceed with electrification but also because these distant facilities with their transmission networks are take very long to build, as long as 10 years, a large part of that because jurisdictions often don't want them running across their land. So, um, so this is building resilience and speeding up the process of building a more robust system. And basically, if you, next slide, please. You can think of solar energy as one source, and here we have a solar array and battery microgrid, which is in, located in a pretty, seems to be a pretty remote part of Alaska. Uh, Dave and I looked it up on, on the map and it is, uh, it's sort of hard to describe how remote it is, but you can imagine that these kids formerly had to rely on diesel power uh, to, to power their town. And now they have this microgrid, which, uh, which uh, helps out a lot, but for more, uh, less remote locations, often microgrids are supplement to the existing power network and they increase resilience. As I said a moment ago, uh, when the power goes down, uh, they come on. There is, uh, you can do this with solar and battery storage or as Puget Sound Energy is done over in Glacier, uh, 
several uh, container sized um, battery packs, which in this case are two megawatt battery installation, which is used to stabilize uh, current delivery to customers at the end of a very long and vulnerable uh, over, uh, overhead transmission line uh, up the Mount Baker Highway. Uh, over in, um, in, um, uh, in Opalco in, in the, um, I'm trying to remember the island, David. Then, oh, um, Decatur Island. Yeah, Decatur Island, thank you. The Opalco Power and Light Company in 2018 put in a um, three and a half acre solar array and a battery pack, which will power about 500 homes for about four hours during an outage. And again, it's stabilization as well as local production of electricity. But what about wind? Wind uh, is, uh, is rapidly, or it seems to be growing quite rapidly uh, along with solar. Uh, let's look at the next slide. Where could we put wind in Whatcom County? This is a uh, global atlas of wind. I never knew these things existed until I joined the committee. But the darker the red, the higher the average wind velocity. And as you can see on the far right, Mont Baker, as you would expect, is pretty windy above treeline. And then when you get down to where people live, not so much until you get over to Lummi Island and lo and behold, up on Lummi Mountain, the winds are going at the same speeds that you can measure up high on Mont Baker. So if it were possible technically to put a wind machine or a series of wind machines on the top of Lummi Mountain, uh, we could generate a lot of power here and in fact export it. And I've uh, joked with people that we could then become the Saudi Arabia of Whatcom County with all that power. So let's move to the next slide. And I think that's you. Uh, Thank you, Charles. So solid waste actually only accounts for 1% of greenhouse gas emissions in Whatcom County, but plastic waste is uh, a growing problem and it requires 17 million barrels of oil just to produce all the disposable water bottles that, that are used in this country every year. It's kind of shocking. I learned that from Wendy. But uh, why not use reusable containers instead and find one of these filling stations uh, like they have at the community food co-op? It also turns out that more than one third of food produced in this country is thrown away. So we can all buy or grow what we need, only what we need and compost what we can't use. In Bellingham, they actually now have curbside collection of, of uh, food waste and they're taking it up to a facility in Linden where they're turning it into a usable uh, product. So uh, that's potentially an option for the island in the future if there were enough people here uh, that were interested. And I am going to shift us to propane, Charles. Yeah. The next slide. Yeah. Why should we shift out of propane? Well, propane is a fossil fuel and it's contributing to climate change. And space and water heating are, um, are the largest source of home energy carbon emissions. And also the cost of propane and natural gas uh, is uh, going up. So this graphic uh, shows the comparison. Basically, um, it shows that the operating cost of an efficient electric heat pump is less than a propane or natural gas furnace and much less than electrical baseboard heat. Not only that, it provides both heating and cooling. And so as summers get hotter, you can better cope with the heat. And as a neighbor pointed out to me recently, as, as if air quality from forest fires um, degrades as it has for several years, several summers, being able to cool and uh, your house uh, and uh, filter the air will become uh, in, uh, increasingly important. So heat pumps, again, they, uh, the energy comes from taking latent heat out of the air and they can operate in either direction, make heat or 
keep you cool and it's cheap and there's subsidies. So what's wrong with this picture? I think people on Lummi are already beginning to get it. And I know people who have already changed, including last week. Next slide, please. And that's, that's mine. Thank you, Charles. I would just add that if the grid does go down, that's where um, having a heat pump potentially is a problem. But there, there is the option of battery backup instead of having a generator. And as, as we've seen, the cost of batteries has been declining and will continue to, to decline. So um, as battery systems become more affordable, uh, that may be an option instead of propane, even as, as a backup. As far as other things we can do here on the island, well, storing carbon with forestry and agriculture is something that we're already doing, thankfully. Um, and in addition to reducing greenhouse gas emissions, um, we can slow climate change by storing carbon in trees and soil. Uh, the Heritage Trust has recently done tree planting projects at the Curry Preserve and the Aston Preserve. This is uh, showing the Aston Preserve. And uh, in terms of agriculture, climate smart agriculture, as it's known, is a way that we can store carbon in the soil through techniques like uh, cover crops and no-till agriculture or low-till uh, agriculture. And um, that's something that's being done on the island and that we can encourage uh, more of. And I will turn it back to you, Charles. Uh, next, final slide, please, or final point. Um, probably you all received this in the mail I did uh, a few days ago from our member of Congress, Rick Larson, and I looked at it and I thought, okay, here's a pop quiz. Um, what's, what could be added? What would one say when in fact climate change seems to cut across all of these priorities that he asks us to choose among here? And what additional feedback would we give? So. Uh, Click again, please. So what's missing? Um, well, my answer to the question is what is, is um, where is Congressman Larson on a climate concern scale from one to 10? Or is it that many of his con constituents are still three or four on such a scale? But there should be a way to, for our elected officials to, uh, talk to us about climate change, and particularly for Mr. Larson, who's been a champion of our ferry and the Guaymas Island Ferry, and who chairs uh, the transport committee in the, uh, it's a ranking member, sorry, of the transportation committee in the U.S. House of Representatives. So how send him a message? What sort of, click again, please. What would you write back to our congressman? So this is just uh, this is just to make the point that um, while we are considering doing all these or some of these or none of these or other things with respect to climate change, we need to help our uh, our representatives in the county council, in the state government, uh, and in the our representatives in the Congress uh, to take practical steps. Uh, the Congress has done a lot. Fortunately, uh, Governor Inslee. Uh, is very well known for his climate change uh, positions, but um, we need to constantly do more to remind them of the larger picture. So uh, last slide, please. So we'll end again as we began with this terrific book by Catherine Hayhoe, and here she is on PBS saying in her very friendly way, what are we waiting for? If we wanted to accomplish this, we could. And she's right. So thank you very much. And again, we're your neighbors and we're not particularly expert, but we are happy to have this opportunity to share these ideas with you and uh, want to participate in the discussion. And thank you, Wendy Pickerel, for all you've done to make this possible. 
Not a round of applause for Charles and David. Well, I do want to say that we're lucky that not only did we get to learn about something that maybe we can build on, but that we have two people in our own community who we can go to and ask these questions of, and they can give us what isn't necessarily insider information, but maybe that you don't have to show up at one of the committee meetings. But I do want to say there is a committee meeting coming up April 20th. Um, I am not, I, I, I was telling Alan earlier, I used to work for politicians. I'm not one who easily gets my arm twisted to go to a lot of public meetings anymore because I've been to a lot of them. But I have to say, when I did attend the um, uh, advisory committee's meeting, I actually found it incredibly fascinating and actually uplifting. <laughs> and I don't often get to say that about like uh, public government meetings. I found it really engaging um, the different experts that were speaking and the topics that they're working on. So if you do have that evening free, that or I think it's the 20th of April, the 18th of May, double check, it's going to be in the email I send you, um, you can attend virtually. So there you go, and you can learn more. Um, but with that, uh, I want to kind of get the question started with, I think that whether Dave and uh, Charles can answer this, I think where my mind goes straight to, and I'd love to hear from the rest of you is, okay, uh, what can we do? Richita said this when she walked in today, you know, what's the most important thing, you know, what can we do to build off this plan and some of the things I heard Charles were the, you know, some of the low hanging fruit in my mind is, you know, the county wants to install EV stations. So what do we do to work with the county to get some EV stations installed on land here on Lummi Island, you know, what would that be? Um, and then longer term, looking at some of the other actions that they want to take, um, and how can we collaborate with them to make sure that's happening here on Lummi. And I don't know if on the advisory committee side, Dave or Charles, if you guys have any sense of what that engagement by communities might look like, I imagine it would be call Lauren. Yeah. <laughs> yeah? Uh, yes, I think so. I think the important part of Lauren's work has to be, and I'm sure she would agree with this, uh, spending time with people around the county and uh, trying to knit together networks uh, of purpose. So I think she's a resource. So I want to ask in the room, who has a question or a comment? Anybody? No? Yes. Right into the ball. Bouldering Place has phase three electricity, which means that we can not only put in a charging station, we can put in a phase three a charging station, which the ferry um, dock here can only put in phase two. Mm -hmm. yeah, you're, you're, you're right. Right. So <laughs> go ahead, go ahead, Dave. Um, that that sounded to me like Joanne Philpot, someone who knows more about uh, um, electric chargers than than I probably do. But um, so what we're talking about is having a, a a fast charger, one that can charge a car from empty to full in maybe as little as a half an hour, and um, most people have a home charger that's a level two charger. That's that's what we have, and it might take four to five hours to charge the car, which is not a big deal when you do it at night. But when you are short on time, it is nice to have a fast charger. Is that what you were getting at, Joanne? Yes, that's exactly what I was trying to say. And you need phase three electricity to do that. Mm -hmm. Joanne, you know, for us, how is how is gathering space going to allow the islanders to use that what's the what's going to be the policy or the rule or the process well tom's working on the policies now and they are being um formed and um i think that we will know quite shortly excellent great yeah. awesome so we have a question uh Dave, I'm going to read it for bait. I'm sorry, I don't have my glasses, so I'm going to cheat okay. here. Uh, the plan does not seem to have, the climate impact plan does not seem to have a community engagement component. Considering the political opposition to efforts addressing climate change, this seems crucial. So I know that you worked on the plan in the beginning. Can you speak to that? Right. Well, um, we, we did have a community engagement component that we did 
before we even started drafting the plan, and that was the community research project that was actually um, done in partnership with the League of Women Voters in Whatcom County. And that's, that report is available on the website, but um, we definitely need more community engagement. And we're hoping that this dashboard is, is going to stimulate more community interaction with the committee. Um, uh, we're, I, I think Charles would would agree that we're open to suggestions on, you know, whether we need to put a, a billboard on the side of a WTA bus or um, have have the one one thing that we've done um, that is kind of an informal outgrowth of the Climate Impact Advisory Committee is. Uh, a, a Twitter feed that Steve Harrell, one of our uh, committee members, set up, and he is providing news about what the county is doing. But I, I'd love to hear suggestions. Yeah, Dave, I think you've summarized it very well. Uh, remember that the committee was uh, re rejuvenated, as you mentioned in your earlier in um, 2019, uh, basically to get a actionable plan, uh, time bound specific uh, steps. And, uh, and it did that through co community consultation. And then I think the idea has been that the county would then move forward with the climate action manager and the committee itself would remain just an advisory committee rather than doing much outreach. But I think the, the, the point is a very good one. And I'm going to raise this with the committee um, as to whether we can do more. The same Steve Harrell has worked with Bellingham High School students on a series of videos about climate change that they uh, were making. Because uh, we all agree on the committee that we really the, this all needs to engage young people. And it, most of us on the committee are, are not young people. So um, suggestion, very welcome. Uh, thank you for raising the point. And one, one thing I'll add, uh, last fall, the, the, some of the committee members actually got together and hosted a, a seminar on heat pumps that was part of Bellingham's Climate Week. And, and that was sponsored by the committee. And it was a way to raise awareness about the committee, but also about uh, a key uh, action that people can take. Who in the room? I, I know there was another hand. Richie? So as we come to the conclusion of the current legislative session, there's been some allocation of the climate commitment funds. Do you know of any that have been allocated to Whatcom County? And, um, and you have a wish list of what we would ask for for 2024. I, I am almost certain that uh, Lauren Clemens has a wish list. Um, but that is a great question. I do not uh, know um, if any of those funds have been allocated for Whatcom County. I, uh, I think that's something maybe Charles can look into. Right. We are in the May meeting. Gosh, that's already, yeah. The May meeting uh, going to do a review of all the legislation uh, that has gotten climate related legislation. So that for those of you who follow uh, the details of all of these bills that have been trying to get passed, this would be a, a good good place to go to hear what actually happened. Um, the um, And then Lauren will give a report every month on what not only her activities, but also sources of funding. Um, a lot of this is all pretty new. And so having her uh, is really going to make a big difference because there was really nobody else in the county government who was really full-time, nobody full-time charged with 
trying to pull all of these things together and sort of say, hey, new funds are coming. What about doing A, B, and C? So um, another very good question, and I will follow up. And it looks like Rayma has a question for us. Uh, yeah, that's okay. Hi. Yeah, I I'm um, interested in hearing that there are now new perspective perspectives of having uh, solar wind legislation changing. I remember sitting in on a county council meeting. I don't know if it was eight. 10 years ago, it was about the ferry, but they voted down putting, allowing uh, solar wind on our mountaintops, like going, going down I-5, that they, they decided against that. They just said the Pacific Northwest area is not ready for that. Uh, do you have any indication that uh, county council is and it, thinking differently these days? Yeah, the uh, revised code is going to go before council uh, probably within the next month or two. Um, we wrote a revised code in our committee, which is now with the planning commission. And basically it removes a lot of those restrictions. It's careful about the environmental restrictions uh, having to do with you know, wildlife that might be caught in the rotor blades and so forth. But it makes it possible to um, uh, consider installations uh, with much less setback from boundaries than had been that had been a problem in the past um, and on uh, various kinds of private land. The old code uh, only allowed uh, installations of a certain size. There was a size limit and then a land use category, industrial or forestry, which meant that most people couldn't take advantage of it. Uh, that's going to change. We have a question uh, from Catherine. It does seem that the island is a perfect place to implement practices that allow us to be more resilient and self-sustained. And this would be to you, Dave and Charles. Um, do you know of, or does the council or the committee provide resource information for projects such as microgrid components? Um, Dave, do you, you wanna uh, tackle that? I don't know offhand that they do. Um, we have several members. I mentioned that the two members that have collaborated on designing actually quite a detailed plan for a square mile solar array at Cherry Point. And there's one of them, Ray Kameda, who's the atmospheric scientist who uh, loves the details of technical project development. So, um, and, uh, but he does that uh, out of his expertise and interests, but the committee as a whole doesn't do that, uh, or at least not yet. Uh, I can imagine a time when there that the committee might be asked by uh, the county executive to have an opinion on a project, or even to sketch out a, a feasibility study on a project. But that would be for the county government, because remember, the committee's job is to advise council and the county executive. Dave, do you want to add anything? I don't know if Mike Skihan is here, but uh, he has learned a lot about microgrids. And there is, uh, I'm not sure if it's an, a nonprofit, but there's something called Microgrid Knowledge. And they sponsor conferences, and their website has a wealth of information about microgrid projects that are in development or have been completed. Um, and that's, I, I, I believe I've learned about that microgrid project in rural Alaska through, through their website. So that, that might be a good resource. Yeah, you can also get on their mailing list and get something every day in your mailbox with something interesting about it. Um, but yeah, that, that's that's and if anyone wants that, uh, I'm happy to send them. What was the name of the group again? Microgrid knowledge. And another thing you might look into 
is the Arlington um, microgrid project in Arlington, Washington. The Snohomish Public Utility District actually developed a microgrid project uh, that includes a solar array. And uh, when I was still on the committee, we were talking with um, their manager about uh, doing a field trip down there to learn more about their microgrid. So yeah, let me just... I'm not sure if that's happened yet, Charles. Uh, well, no, it, it hasn't um, yet. But this is just to add, this is the, uh, it's called, uh, affectionately known as the SNOPUD, Snohomish County Public Utility District. And uh, these public utility districts were set up in the 1930s and then uh, many of them, and, and some of them are quite large, particularly in the eastern part of the state and Snohomish County. Ours is, is quite small and it's headquartered in Ferndale and it supplies Bonneville uh, hydropower to uh, Cherry Point and it uh, owns uh, a lot of the senior water rights in the Nooksack and supplies water uh, to farmers. And uh, Christine Grant, who is the chair of the commission right now and uh, and her two commissioners are very have have actually are quite serious about well they're serious about everything i suppose but two things are priorities uh, one is the spread of broadband within the county to underserved particularly rural remote areas and the second is seeing what can be done to bring more green energy into the county Right now, PSE is, uh, supplies uh, most parts of the county. Uh, the city of Blaine and Su city of Sumas have their own power companies. Um, and so those four, uh, Blaine, Sumas, the PUD and PSE uh, uh, are, are the sources of all the public um, the electricity grid in the county. So our PUD has been looking into uh, the cost of buying the grid in the county from PSE. And a report has just come out, which I can send to you. Uh, and they're going to, or maybe they just have had a presentation on it. But basically, um, they concluded that it was not financially viable for them. But I think it's worth floating with them the idea that they might build microgrids, like going back to the snowpud. Uh, their microgrid is actually their headquarters in Arlington, and uh, it's a uh, solar and battery array, and it's designed to provide stability to their operations and allow their headquarters to operate, that is to continue to operate their network and service delivery uh, in the event of natural disaster. So they're quite, um, they're quite ahead of the game, it seems to me. And I see no reason why we can't get our own uh, Whatcom County uh, PUD um, moving in that direction. Thanks, Charles. Um, looks like Aria has a, a question in the chat about food waste. And before we before we go there, I have a question to piggyback on what you were saying about it not being viable, um, uh, financially viable for the UD to uh, perhaps buy out PSE. And I'm wondering if the the public utility district has looked into the um, any of the incentives from the infrastructure reduction or and for the the bilateral infrastructure at, um, law or the Inflation Reduction Act, those funds that are being mobilized now, um, uh, has that been looked into as um, if it would be uh, applicable? I don't know, but I found Christine Grant answers her phone. So why don't you call her? Okay. She's an elected official. All right, good, thank you. So let's... Uh... Dave, can you read Ariane's question? I'm I can. She she asked, does anyone know if there has been any progress on getting a food waste truck from the mainland to pick up curbside on Lummi Island? Or has anyone heard a discussion of community food waste collection, uh, establishing a community food waste collection site on the island? Um, 
area looked into it a few years ago, uh, the curbside collection, I guess, and um, there wasn't enough demand on the island. So I actually called the general manager of uh, sanitary service last Friday and had a discussion with him about it and said, if we had enough people who pledged to sign up, uh, would you send a truck out here? And he said, well, um, we could look into it and uh, I need to figure out how many people that would be and I'll, I'll get back to you next week. So I will report back on that one. Hi, this is Carrie Gard. And just to piggyback on what you just said, um, I did too call um, and not sure a couple months ago, I think it was, and got the same answer. So there is, I know there's interest on the island, but the specific number of like how many people or poundage or however they figure it out, that wasn't given. But um, I think there's, I think we can do this. So I, yep. I will call them back. <laughs> I, while I'm here too, I just want to thank you both for being here. It's just been, I just really appreciate your time. And I was looking over the, 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 the what is it? The climate action, the plan. climate action plan. It's just really impressive. And just that you're all volunteers and you spend your time doing something that you're, you're so passionate about. So just really appreciate you being here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Here's a paper copy. In the, in the chat. Yeah. But they, uh, yeah. They're available at Public Works. You should go get one. They're quite elegant in their paper form. Or if you prefer, they're, of course, available online. Uh, I was just going to, this is Alan, I'm not on camera. I was just going to say, um, the I really like the idea of the food waste truck. Maybe what uh, Resilient Lummy can do is work with us and we can create uh, an article for the tone and then have them go to a polling uh, thing that we can set up on the website to see how many people are interested and, and maybe estimate how much garbage they produce because I think it's a very valuable thing. That, that's that's a great idea, Alan. And I, I checked with uh, my dentist in Bellingham, who's my oldest friend who actually grew up in Sunrise Cove. And it turns out that he and his wife switched from bi-weekly trash pickup to monthly when they got the curbside food waste uh, collection bi-weekly. And they are saving a few dollars a month doing that and it's meeting their needs because uh, they're generating so little garbage now that they have the, the food waste bin. Off topic, but who is your dentist? <laughs> Eric McCrory, Dr. <laughs> Eric McCrory. You were going to say because he told me he <laughs> okay, do we have it's any a small world. I knew that that was your going to say. Does anybody have, by the way, Dr. McCrory is an excellent dentist and also an alum of our, our institution, <laughs> the Beach School. Does anybody uh, have? Uh, any other questions in the room or online? No. Okay. Well, I have, a, I have a question, which is uh, we could have picked other topics to talk about for local action. Are there things that people have in mind that we haven't discussed or should be looked into more? Nobody's grabbing the mic on my end. Save it for another meeting. Joe's got something. I got one thing. Um, what is happening with the single-use plastic law HR something with thirty-five in it? I think. Um, what does anyone know? What's happening with that? It passed. It passed. Yeah, it passed both houses. Passed both houses. Okay. Is that the deposit uh, for... includes that. Yeah. Includes that. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Good progress. Progress. I do have one follow-up question, just so people understand a little more clearly. Dave, can you talk about the, um, I wrote it down, I wrote it down, uh, the dashboard. We've, re we've been refer referring to it in this conversation as the dashboard, but what is that going to be to the public? What is the dashboard going to do for people like ourselves or other people in Whatcom County? What's the, how can we exercise it as a tool? Right, and, and 
uh, I really just did background research on uh, on dashboards that had been created by other communities. Charles was, you know, giving me more uh, credit than I deserved, but I I appreciate that. the The dashboard would actually be tracking key indicators of um, what the county is doing. It it creates a, a measure of accountability for the county in um, implementing the climate action plan. So, uh, for example, uh, the conservation easement program, the dashboard uh, could track how many acres are, are being funded through that program for protection of agricultural or uh, forest land. And uh, emissions from from buildings, the county buildings, that's that's going to be tracked um, and reported on. So it'll be somewhat interactive. Uh, there is actually going to be a presentation by Lauren Clemens about the dashboard at the, uh, this week's meeting on Thursday. I just discovered that in looking at the agenda. So um, Charles, can you add anything to uh, what's planned for the dashboard? Uh, no, I accept that uh, it does need community input, just like the overall plan uh, benefited the required community input. And uh, I'm a great advocate of having it be useful to the public, not just officials who are trying to meet targets and uh, people who want to actually have some metrics or some graphs or something that is comprehensible so they know how things are going, where do we stand? What kind of progress are we making on reducing emissions? There are very ambitious targets in, in this plan. Um, you know, 45% reduction in greenhouse gases from public facilities, I think, or is it the overall county by 2030? I think it's the overall county. Right. And uh, okay, is that just a number picked out of a hat or there, what, what's the underlying factors and mechanisms and processes that will actually make that number go down. And that's what my aspiration for seeing in the dashboard. Does that answer the question? It does. It does. I think going forward, there's some things that we part of Nashville understand how to do, but going forward, there may be things we need more information and data on. And I was wondering how we as Resilient Lemming can use the dashboard to help us. So thank you. Uh, with that, I just want to give a last round of applause to our presenters for making the time. They put a lot of uh, energy into their presentations. I do want to say this is going to be email go out. I mentioned that for those of you who joined late, um, some of the information that we covered tonight, uh, some links, and that will be in there. I'll also go and find Mike Skihan's uh, he video, he YouTubed the whole presentation on microgrid. So I'll make sure that that gets into the email and then a few other things. I also took a few notes about things that Resilient Lummy might be able to do going forward as far as actions. If any of you are interested in sort of jumping into the pool with us, it's very uh, nascent. We're very new. Um, we just want to see carbon reduction happen on the island. The only requirement is, is please try to read Hayhoe's book so you're grounded in where we're coming from. Um, with that, I want to thank everybody on this tax day of 2023 for taking the time and uh, joining us. Thank you very much, everybody online as well. It was nice to have you. Thanks a lot, Wendy. Thank you, Chuck. Thank you for all you did, Wendy. No worries. See you guys soon. Okay, bye. Good night. <laughs>